All right, everybody. So welcome to the show. And as uh, as we all know, on Sundays, we try to take a look at what's going on with uh, the portfolio as far as dollar cost averaging, all that great stuff. And we're going to talk about some of things that are going on in the crypto market. And uh, for Sundays, I don't like to do this alone. Sometimes I invite some of my friends on. And I got Jerry Hall, Jerry V. Hall from the Jerry Hall Show to come on. So Jerry, welcome back to the uh, show for the 10th time, I think it is. Thank you, Rob. It's good to be here. Looking forward to seeing your portfolio's performance. <laughs> yeah, me and you both. So, uh, yeah, the, the portfolio is the portfolio. And before we get into it, I just got to tell everybody, I know that there's a lot of negativity going on in the world. I am not a geopolitical expert. I don't think Jerry, Jerry Hall is uh, as well. So what's going on in the world, we only try to delve onto the things that we can actually control. And there are things outside of our control. And I am not going to be talking about the, the grand scheme of things and putting my way, my opinion one way, one way or the other. If you want to do that, there's a ton of other channels out there doing that right now, but I'm not going to go and be a geopolitical expert and that's just how it is. But I will say this, having said all that, there's this great book and I've been talking about this on, on Twitter for quite some time. Actually, we've done some videos on this. It's uh, The Fourth Turning. And it's a book that was released in 1997 and it takes a look at just the normal cycles of the not the geopolitical but the financial cycles and how things kind of start with wars and end with wars and the financial aspect of that going in between this is by two authors william strauss and neil howe uh, mr strauss uh, Will, william strauss passed away in 2007 neil howe is a economist and uh, historian and they had a it's a great book uh, to read and so far it looks like things are kind of turning out that way now take everything with a grain of salt i believe in cycles i believe in cycles such as like the four-year cycles, which everything pretty much starts with uh, a, um, a halving, which we saw in 2012. Then we get an all-time high, a dip, and a reset. Then we had another halving in 2016, all-time high, dip, reset. Another halving in 2020. Then we had an all-time high in 2021, dip, and a reset. And we're, gonna, we're due for a halving, right, Jerry? But I don't, is it April, May, somewhere around there? Yeah, it's, uh, I believe it's the start of the second quarter of 2024. Cool. Well, we'll take that, right? So when we see all these things, uh, the book itself, you can order on Amazon. I don't have a link for it, but if you just search the fourth turning, I mean, it's, only, it's the first thing that's going to come up. But just to, just to show you how it kind of works out, I was trying to condense the book into something visual as best I could. And again, cycles. And there's a couple of different cycles that people look at. We also take a look at the real estate cycles, financial cycles. But this one's pretty interesting because it goes 80-year cycles. And it's in 20-year blocks. And everything pretty much starts with wars or ends of wars. And if we take a look between 1783 and 1863, 20, 80 years, the Revolutionary War in America, that was the end, around 1783. Then we have this awakening when there's like this, um, this euphoria stage and everybody's like, we can do no wrong. This is fantastic. There's a lot of building. Then things start to become unraveled as we have different problems. Then we have a crisis. And this happened in 1861, U.S. Civil War started. So with the U.S. Civil War, 1965, going all the way to, through 1944, that was the start of the World War II and the Great Depression. And then for the next cycle, again, 80 years, which is roughly the time span of the average person, depending on you know, in what geographical location you had, about 80 years. So 1945 to 20, 2025, 1945 was the end of World War II. Then you had the boomers from 1946 to 64. We break it down even further. Awakening when everything was just going great and, you know, great middle class. Everything was actually working out pretty well, 65 to 84. Then Gen X, 85 to 2004, things started to unravel. I think we saw that in a lot of different industries. And, of course, we see a crisis. And there's many, been many crises. We had the Great Recession from 2008 to, to 2009, 2010. We had uh, wars also, uh, that uh, war in Iraq, war in Afghanistan. And this is ending up in the tail end around 2025. Now, what happens? It's anybody's guess. I will tell you that. But I saw there was a good talk with Arthur Hayes, uh, BitMEX, former CEO. And he talked about how he believes that the next major bull run is going to happen uh, between 2024, maybe 2025. And then he sees different problems going on from there. So again, not an expert, but it was interesting how this all turned out as far as the four year or the uh, fourth turning. And lastly, I think this is uh, pretty accurate. Hard times create strong men. 
strong men create good times, good times create weak men, and weak men create hard times. And I kind of feel like, and I could be wrong, I kind of feel like that's where we're at. And there's a great video, which I linked in the description about what's the fourth turning. You can take a look at it. But again, take it with a grain of salt because nobody, nobody can predict the future and price predictions. So before I get on to the, to the portfolio, Jerry, want to add me? That was a, that was a wild ride, huh, Jerry, to start off the, start off the show? Oh, that was wonderful. Folks, I did not know he was going to do that, but I'll tell you. <laughs> That's true. We didn't, we didn't talk about it. About that though, Rob, is that it's right in line with, with a core thesis that I have that's built around understanding demographics, right? Yeah. And so this incredible, the largest population generation that the world has ever seen, we call the baby boomers. And they were the, the ones coming, mm -hmm. they were the babies that were made after World War II. And their last year as a generation it was 1964. Well, mm -hmm. the largest portion of that entire generation was 1956 to 1964. Mm -hmm. With the largest retirement age group that our country has ever seen, and we're in that now. And so, how does that play out for us as the, in these boom and bust cycles? Well, they're no longer in their jobs contributing to their 401ks, helping up stock prices, they're going to transition to what? Well, the bond market over the last 15 years has been garbage. Yeah. Well, however, the last year and a half. Been great. Wow. Yeah. We have the largest segment of our workforce retiring into a positive environment for fixed income. Exactly what they want. Right? Yeah. It's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Will the stock market take a hit? Will we continue to see a high rate in coming from our friends at the Fed? <laughs> Will this demographic do with the fact that we're going to sell, hold that, or transition into? It's going to be really interesting to check out. And it's right in line. <laughs> yeah, we'll see, Jerry. We'll see. I don't know what's going to happen, but uh, it's just it's just a good mental exercise to take a look at these things and go, man, that's, I mean, everything is cycles. It kind of works in that same way. But again, uh, who knows? But it is interesting. The boomers are rapidly advancing and uh, we'll see how it all plays out. So having said all that, and this is what I truly believe, um, that as time has gone on, when I grew up, it was all about, you know, get a job, work 30 years, get a pension, retire, live off in, and right off in the sunset. Put your money into a savings account, get a whopping 0.25% yield and just ride that off in the sunset. And I think now if you're not this, I cannot give you financial advice. You can do it. You can put it in a savings account right now. It's not awful. There's high yield savings account. But I personally believe that if we don't invest into assets, we got problems coming up and big problems. So I... One of my investments is crypto and digital assets. Go figure. And uh, what I've been trying to do is talk about dollar cost averaging. And I thought to myself, you know, it'd be good is just to just to show people, you know, how things work out as time goes on. Because I got to tell you, I got to tell you, in the uh, in the YouTube space and a lot of spaces, there's very few people that'll tell you like, you know, what I'm down, or I didn't this didn't work out, or this is this is uh, how much percentage I'm down. It's always up only. And people are always talking about diamond hands and you got to just buy those dips con consistently and don't look at the, at the negativity. But I think you do sometimes just to see where you're at. So having said that, I go, well, let's just start this on September 1st. I'm going to, and I don't know where, what everybody's position is. So I said, how about we do this? Let's just do $10 a week and invest into the different various cryptos that I want to invest into. And we'll see how it goes. I personally invest into, and this can be daily or weekly, it depends on, on the, uh, the crypto, but Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, Cosmos, Arbitrum, Chainlink, Polkadot, Near, Polygon, Cardano, Algorand, Dogecoin. Jerry, any of those you, you like to pick up? They're all in my portfolio. Son of a gun. Look at that. That's why we talk. All right. So we take a look at that as, as of September 1st. Remember, September, September is supposed to be, what what they call it? Rectember? Rectember. Rectember. And I was like, yeah, probably. And I was like, that's good because I don't want to keep buying this expensive crypto and it's been going down. So I thought it'd go down even more and it didn't. So that kind of sucked. But it, we take a look here as of October 2nd. Let me change this. 
what's the eighth? Correct. Yeah, not bad. Yeah, I'm still up. I mean, if you just would have done September 1st, 2023, I'm going to show you the good and the bad. Don't worry. Everybody's like, don't cherry pick. I'm like, I, yeah, you're right. You're right. But Solana, <clears throat> I invested 50. I now have $59, Jerry. That's almost 19%. Chain link, I'm up seven bucks or 13 and a half percent. Arbitrum, for some reason, I'm up. That's amazing. Arbitrum was dying, dying to me. But even though I really like the, I really like the project, everything's up, so I'm pretty happy. So if we take a look at this, like that looks pretty good, Rob. What if we went again? I'll show you the, I'll show you the good parts. Today is October eighth, ninth, eighth, October eighth. Let's take the four-year cycles. This, this year and month, or this year, would kind of correspond to 2019, right? As we look in like all-time high, 2017, dip, then a reset. So let's say we went back to 2019. We did the same things, 10 bucks a week. Because people are like, well, how much can you make for 10 bucks a week? It doesn't make any sense. I mean, I got to put in hundreds of thousands of dollars to make it, right? I mean, even the Dogecoin millionaire put in like $123,000 or something like that in Dogecoin when it was nothing. And of course, he made a lot, but he didn't make a lot because he didn't sell anything. But we take a look at this. If you'd done this and waited till, you know, the high, you'd be up massively. You'd have invested 900 bucks and Dogecoin would have 136,000. Matic 74, Ada 25,000, Solana 16,5. And even if you would have screwed up, like we all do, come over here, you'd still be up on some of them. On Matic, you would have invested $2,000. And as of today, you'd have 24,000. Doge, 18,000. Solana, 9,000. Not bad, right? ETH, now you'd still be down on some dot, algo, near, and arbitrum. But let's say you did what I did. And you said, you know what? You take your profits, you took your lumps, and you're like, I'm going to start doing this in 2022, which is what I was be I've been doing for quite some time. Dollar cost averaging, this is what I'm down. So I'm up on some things, Bitcoin, Solana, Link, ETH, but I'm down a pretty hefty amount of Doge, Cardano, Dot, Atom, Matic, Near, Algo, and Arbitrum. The thing is, though, and Jerry can attest to this, you don't lose money until you sell. And on the flip side, you don't make money until you sell. So Jerry, what do you think there? Honest opinion? You know, if the thesis was put some money into something that you believe in the future is going to have a, uh, give you a good ROI, a return on investment, then, then getting caught up in the weirdness that happens within a cycle yeah. is, is troubling, right? Just let sit it and forget it. Put your money in. So, yeah, I agree. But, you know, like, like, I think there's a couple of cryptos you can do that with, like Bitcoin, you can set it and forget it, right? But there's some, like, okay, here's an example, Gala. I bought it on, I bought it on um, Coinbase, and I thought it was going to upgrade from V1 to V2 because there's a different version. And um, it didn't upgrade, and I didn't even pay attention to it because I wasn't really actively thinking about it. So I went there today to go take a look at it, Gala V1. I can't sell it. I don't know if I can move it, maybe in a Coinbase wallet. So it's like one of those things where like people are like, you know, just like what you said, Jerry, there's some cryptos you can do, sell it and forget it, and you're good. But there's some that do some screwy things like that that you can't. Interesting. You know, I've been a big fan of layer one projects that I can buy some of, yeah. take them, compound the rewards and, and, and walk away and let time in the market decide if I did a good job or not. You know what I mean? So Cardano and Solano and yeah. Magic and, you know, that the list goes on and on and on of these proof of stake protocols that you can buy some, have a private wallet that you have the keys to, take them and, and walk away and allow that, that compounding effect of the yield generated by the proof of stake protocol to be your, your, um, ECA. Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah, that's a good idea. So and that this poor guy did in Costa Rica and I'm still doing it to this right this very second. See, that's a good lesson, everybody. If you can do that and compound it and DeFi and D de cause that's what you do a lot of Jerry, right? You, you farm. Well, not anymore. No, it's no. basically, no, the, the, the safest sound strategy now, right? I, I, I yield farmed when it was appropriate. It's no longer appropriate. What I do is I, I own the tokens and I stake them with validators, just like 
for instance, plug bias, my Cardano is staked with we News Validator on the, on the ADA network. And I'm happy to do that because the rewards are compounding within my wallet. Nobody knows about it but me and you and the 500 million people that are going to watch this. <laughs> and then someday I'll go back to that wallet when, when it's appropriate and go, wow, I'm sure glad I compounded all those rewards because now look, bang. When you, so Jerry, how about this? When you compound it, do you take it out and, and put it into cash, put it into stables, or do you put it right back into the? No, I just like, for instance, my D news validator in the Cardano network, mm -hmm. my rewards compound within my principal amount. So every epoch, when I get my rewards, the rewards are added to the principal, principal amount. So the next epoch, five days later, a new set of yield is open. It might have started with 100 tokens, and then it's 110 tokens, it's 116 tokens, it's 125 tokens, and every time the new yield is generated on the new balance, the new principal balance, it's compounding within the wallet. It's magic. Magic. Yeah, it's magic. You, you know, we you know we got to talk about with, with everybody is when to take some profits at some point. Because like I, I, was, I was looking at it, I remember this. I remember using Luna. And Luna was like the new, the greatest thing of all time, right? But Luna came out in like 20, 2020? I forget. 2020? No, or was it 2019? 2019. That was 2019. That from Do Kwan or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And then three years later, it collapsed. Cause like, I wonder, like, because me personally, I'm not going to, like, on that situation, I kind of wait a little bit and I, I could see why you'd want to put it in because we're not in the bull market, right? Yet, right? I think. The, all the shenanigans and all the problems kind of happen in the bull market because people do the craziest, most ridiculous stuff out there and they get caught doing whatever, whatever wrongdoing that they're doing when the next bear market comes. I think right now, this is a pretty brutal bear market. It's very boring. It's very sideways. I don't know what else could collapse except probably more banks, especially like uh, uh, mid-tier banks. But who, I, I'm not going to say like nothing could, could happen, but uh, it makes me think about like, when to take those profits and really get into it. So you're not like compounding, compounding, putting into the project, and then it collapses. But that's different with, with Cardano. They've been around since been around since 2017. I think they're going to do pretty well. Solana, same type of thing. Avalanche and Cosmos and Bitcoin, Ethereum. I, I think those are the ones that, you know, pretty well. I think. I could be wrong. Hey, speaking of which, talking about like, like compounding and things like that and what's up and whatever. Here's a... Uh, Here's your favorite, Jerry, Hypercycle. I just, cause we were, you know, I, I was taking a look at like, I'm like pretty happy with my, <laughs> where did I go? I was pretty like ecstatic, you know, with like five, my 14% or 20% or whatever it was with Solana. I took a look at a Hypercycle and you guys are up for the year. What are you guys up? Like in 14 days, you're up 50% and 30 days, you're up 73%. So. Well, then there's a couple of things with that. Number one, AI is, is a hot topic, right? AI is a, uh, people are just shotgunning money into the AI space. If it has something to do with AI, people put money into it. That's yeah. one element. So we're, we're riding an a, that trend. But the element of hypercycle, the token, the token, unlike many other protocols, is more than just for governance and for security, like most proof of stake protocols require the tokens as the stake right and you're yeah. secured to the level of dollar value of stake that you have the tokens in hypercycle are actually internetwork currency and identification so for you to operate a node which is the desired goal everybody should, if you're in that world should want to be operating a node you need the tokens because the tokens are how AI agents pay other AI agents for the computation that's going to occur within the network. Yeah, just, yeah, because we talk about this, hold on, I have it up. Walk me through this again with okay. HyperCycle, because like I have not, I, I know AI is going to be big. I just talked to a couple different projects okay. actually. So, big picture. We believe by 2026, and this isn't HyperCycle, this is the world of AI, believes that by 2026, 95% of all internet transactions will be a machine to another machine. And only 5% of financial transactions on the internet will be human beings. That's sure. the scope and 
scale that we believe AI will be interacting financially on the internet. Okay, so with that being said, HyperCycle is several things. HyperCycle.ai is a software company that created the means in which AI agents can work on a network to have contracted work with other AI agents. So your your vitamin C AI module that's going to do worse uh, research on the various different kinds of vitamin C compounds you can extract will be looking for Uh -huh. See, AI froze you, Jerry. That's the problem. We can't have nice things because they keep breaking us down. What'd you say? I'm sorry. So uh -huh. in, the big thing is that we believe there will be many networks where AI is contracting and doing things with other AI, and we will be one of these networks in a decentralized distributed world yeah. where, where computation, which I, we believe is the next commodity, Oil drove the last industrial general, uh, revolution. We believe data and computation will drive the next industrial revolution. And so we're, we're a network of computation. When you talk about, yeah, I got you. When you talk about AI agents, are you talking about just the, the actual computation of what's going on with artificial intelligence? Are you talking about something like a node? So let's say, let's say you're a medical researcher, Dr. Dr. Rob. And, and one of the things that you want to do is you want a ton of computational power put towards crunching numbers in various scenarios to use your vitamin C product for A, B, C, D, and E. And, and you go to Amazon Web Services because you know that cloud computation, they do that, right? And they're going to charge you $150,000 to do that. Well, no. you, that's a lot. Let me shop around a little bit. Oh, I can have an AI developer build that algorithm for me and go to HyperCycle Network and look for free agents to crunch those numbers for me. Oh, look, the quote is $25,000. Oh, so I see. You know, yeah, it's, it's kind of, I get you. It's kind of like, like Amazon Web Service where you're like, oh, do you want to build your own uh, hosting platform? And also you want to, you know, have the actual warehouse? No, well, just pay us because we already did it. Ah, okay. 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 Exactly. So this is like a decentralized, distributed version of what AWS can do for you, but only you can have an AI agent that you set up once and walk away and let it do, do its everything thing. you want it to do, and it'll work and act within the network just like uh, a good business would. Yeah, I got you. So, like, that would. Uh, the, 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 so, last question, because we're going to talk about this in a bit about. Uh, Avalanche, they uh, are using NFTs to track cannabis and hemp. And I think that's, that's like a real use case. You know, that's like real utility. It's not, it's not, I mean, you actually do that. So like with this, with HyperCycle, would you say it's more, it's more of a utility? It actually has real, real utility. And it'd be, uh -huh. it'd be tough for, for your friend, Gary, to uh, sue the pants up all the Americans if they mess in. 100% pick and shovel for sure. It's an uh -huh. infrastructure uh, play. I'll take that. Well, think of it. So that's interesting. Uh, I think I linked that in the description. But this one, because I'm always big on, I, I want to find utility and real utility and things that actually can have a use case. Because I think that's the one way we're going to win against Gary as he's trying to take everybody to court. But here's another thing. Uh, blocticity. It meant hemp and cannabis certifications in Avalanche. So... I, I knew this was an issue. I didn't know it was this big of an issue. So this, uh, the minting is done through a COA, Certificate of Analysis, and that's going to be an NFT. Hemp, cannabis, mushroom, and kratom industry faces supply chain transparency challenges. I remember this was actually talked about in like 2017 with VeChain. And they would say we would do the same thing. We would put it on blockchain and you could track everything. I remember they actually did a trial. I don't know if it was VeChain or somebody else, but they did a trial with Walmart and the pharmacy that was Walmart. And it could track everything from the production of the facility to the transportation to the actual store. And it could tell if the temperature would, would go too high, it would alert and would put it be through an Oracle, put it on the blockchain. I never heard anything else about it. Like that's a pretty good use case. And now I see like through here, let's be honest, like I'm not a marijuana smoker. I just, I just don't. But at, you know, if I get glaucoma or cataracts, I'll probably start. 
But uh, if like I had something like this and I want to know like, is this a good strain or is this a bad strain? Instead of just going, is this a counterfeit? I can just look on the blockchain, which is immutable. So perfect, I can see this. The aim of amending the certificate is allow users to track the COAs back to the lab, access products, test results, avoid fraud. And uh, of course they can have it all in the QR code and there's no alterations. I thought it was a pretty, pretty cool thing of how they did that. So Jerry, what do you think? Good stuff, bad stuff? I, I think NFTs are going to leap out of the art world and get into the authentication world. I, I'm looking forward to the day where I create the Jerry V. Hall NFT that is my digital identity and up, up, you know, that authorizes or authenticates, authenticates me to the world. Yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah. looking forward to that because like how many times, here, here's a good question. How many times do you get impersonated on YouTube, mm -hmm. Twitter, or any of your other social media stuff? You're a big channel. I'm, I can imagine a lot of people try to impersonate you. No. You, well, I mean, some sometimes. You know, so here's a funny story. I was talking to Ben and and, uh, and Guy after one of our shows. Mm -hmm. And I say, you know, if you ever see like those those other YouTube channels where they like will take snippets of other like bigger YouTube channels and they'll like condense it and they'll, they'll do it and and then they'll they'll just use that as their views, which is fine. I, I have an open source for my for all my videos. I go, if you guys if you guys ever see it, they always cut me out. And like so like I'll be there answering a question and they'll like they'll always cut me out and it'll always be Ben and then guy and then back to Ben. And I'm like, that's how you know who's the more important one here. And they're like, Yeah, it's pretty funny. But it is it is pretty hilarious. But I don't get impersonated uh, much at all. Uh, there's some people that that you know take the snippets, but that's it. But I will say. I, I will say one thing. I think that blockchain could be the next aspect of combating uh, these deep fakes. Because I just saw one with Mr. Beast not too long ago. And it was really, really well done. It sounded like him. It looked like him. It's a little jerky, but I think it could work out. And he was saying that, hey, I'm going to give away, I think it was computers or something. Or no, iPhones. A new iPhone. Just go to this link and then send me a little bit and I'll, I'll send you the iPhone. And it was deep fake. And I know that next year... We're going to have a presidential election here in the United States. I think that is going to be a big thing as far as deep fakes. And the only way that I can see that we can combat this would be to be on the blockchain, immutable, and people can actually verify it. So I think it's the same thing with the, with the uh, marijuana. You, you scan it, you go to the laboratory, not a government-run laboratory, but like a laboratory from a private business and say, this is what we did, da, 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 and here it all is, and this is on the blockchain. You can always come back to it, and this is the legit from where it is. I don't know. I mean, I'm on a rant, Jerry. What do you think? No, I, I, the next, I, like I said, I think the next growth spurt for blockchain will be non-fungible tokens, whether it be identity, authentication, whether it be product authentication, whether it be ownership authentication. Can you imagine how, how wonderful it would be if you had the title to your home, your real estate, or your vehicle, and you could go to a, a digital marketplace and do business with whoever will pay yeah. you right you don't have to worry about a bunch of the middlemen i think i think that's the transition and it'll probably occur slowly but surely over the next four or five years and we'll yeah. get gradually acclimated to it and the next thing you know it'll be like the young people are with cell phones it'll be all they know like yeah. you and i remember a world where we actually had a landline in our homes those are awesome if you want to if you want to talk to somebody you had to make some work <laughs> yeah, it's all it's all coming man it's all coming and, and it's fun to see it we're watching it unfold in real time yeah it was just like it was just like i remember when the internet came about and uh people were like this is stupid like i mean i have to i have to sit in i have to log in i have to look at this little guy running around for aol i have to get that ding dong ding dong and then i have to go into these websites where it takes me 10 minutes to download a, an image are you kidding me and that's that's never going to work. And I remember when Netflix was, was saying, we're going to do streaming videos. I'm like, that's going to be that's the dumbest thing of all time. I try to stream any kind of video. It doesn't really work. And of course, technology finally catches up. And that's the thing with like crypto and digital asset space. Like people, they, we're speculating and they get ahead of themselves and they diamond hands, but the tech has not caught up yet to what people actually want to do. I think that's the bigger problem. So, which will lead me to my last story. Tokenization of RWAs or real world assets. I thought that was interesting that Coinbase is doing this. Actually, it's, it's, well, it is Coinbase because it's base. You just, I'm going to take a listen to this and tell me what, if you think, I feel like the SEC is not going to be ticked off about this one. 
So tokenization of U.S. Treasuries arrive on Coinbase's base, which is their uh, L2 layer solution, which is off of Optimism. And no, you can't buy that token. It's uh, within Coinbase and their ecosystem. They're not offering the token. It's just they're using this as blockchain tech. With backed uh, real-world asset token issuance, market for tokenized U.S. Treasuries has grown six. I didn't know this. The market for tokenized tokenized, not just treasuries, but tokenized U.S. treasuries has grown to $666 million. Not bad. Well, so this, yeah, but it's weird though, right? Like you think about like, well, who's buying this? Obviously, it's not Americans because we can't. And I'll show you. So this is issued under the Swiss tokenized securities law. Backed BLB01 crypto token is a blockchain-based version of BlackRock's BlackRock. Short-term U.S. Treasuries ETF that offers a 5.25% annual yield to investors. I got to tell you, I'd go for that, 5%, five and a quarter. Well, actually, I can if I really wanted to as far as like T-bills or notes. U.S. Investors and entities are U.S. investors and entities are restricted from buying the token. Shocker. Tokenization of RWAs is an umbrella term for wrapping traditional financial instruments such as government bonds, private equity, or credit in a token form and placing them on blockchains has become one of the hottest trends in crypto this year. And it's amazing because also Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, said the exact same thing. <laughs> Tokenization of assets is going to be huge. Market for tokenized assets could mushroom to 16 trillion by 2030. Let me say that again. 16 trillion by 2030, according to a Boston consulting group. And they're just guessing everybody. But Jerry, what do you think about this? And why would why would you buy that as far as like a tokenized asset? Because you're out of the United States or something different? You just hit it on the head. Oh. So yes, the United States is the largest capital market on the planet or none, no question, mic drop. However, hmm. the customer base of the United States capital market is 330 million people, the US. Yeah. If you're inside the US, like you're, you're a Costa Rican resident or you're a resident of Spain, you need to have reached like an elite status to get an international grid to acquire uh, U.S. security for you. It's not open and available to come with an internet connection. But you start recognizing And now all of a sudden, is we've got a giant grid. One dollar, two dollars extra a day and buy the fraction of an Apple stock because he knows Apple is going to be around in 25 years. Uh, and he knows, he knows that his country's monetary policy is the base in his turn. But where else would he put his money? He needs to put it in assets. This will open up asset acquisition for a world that has been hungry for it. In the U.S., you're already, you take it for granted because it's yeah. been your whole life. But right. it's not accessible to most of the world. Oh, that's why. Let me see. digital. It's digital, and it's now all of a sudden available at Uniswap or a company like Binance or a company like Coinbase. Now, all of a sudden, you've got, a, you've got potentially a game changer. And that's why, that's why Coinbase branched out out of the United States. But it makes sense because now they're in different markets and different parts of the world so they can offer these things. They don't have to be under the thumb of Gary, the SEC and CFTC. It makes a lot of sense. Okay. Well, that was good because I always look at it through the eyes of an American and uh, like a glutton for that. So thanks, Jerry, for someone from Costa Rica. I so appreciate that. And then um, also I want everybody just to check out, there's a, a website, it's free. But I thought it was interesting. It was called, it's called moneyprinter.info. And I linked it in the description. It's the same guys that do crypto fees. And it took a look at um, how much money are protocols paying to grow. And you can look at it as paying to grow or paying to secure the network. Either way, I just thought it was fascinating that out of the top cryptos that are out there, you know, Bitcoin pays the miners 26, 26 million? 367,360. That's pretty good. Cardano is second and Solana is third. And Dogecoin and Avalanche, that's pretty high. 836,000. 836, vast difference, but still. I don't know where Ethereum is. It should be on here, but it's not. Anyhow, 
you can check that out. Uh, links in the description. I thought it was interesting, but that's it for today. Um, what we'll do is, first of all, Jerry, thanks for stopping by. I appreciate it. Now let's go on to the good stuff, which is everybody gets to ask Jerry a bunch of questions and I get to sit back and do nothing. There'll probably be, Jerry, what's going on with your mic? Folks, I'll be honest. I have no idea what's going on my mic. It's just a USB plug-in microphone that I plugged in. and It works, some, it works pretty well sometimes. It sounds good to me. All right. So, guys, if you got to take off, take off. Go watch the football. Uh, but hit the like and subscribe on the way out. Let's see.